Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let me first introduce myself. I am Dr. Varashri, who works as an associate professor at the Department of Biochemistry, Kaspra Medical College, Manipal. Today I will be talking to you about a topic called as extended lipid profile. To introduce you to the topic, extended lipid profile is nothing but a comprehensive tool which is used to screen, to diagnose and to monitor something what is called as dyslipidemias. Now, dyslipidemia means that there is something abnormal in the levels of lipid of our serum. This can either be hypo or it can be hyper. The term dys means either it can be hyper or hypo which means that either there can be an excess of lipids or there can be a decrease in the levels of lipids in our body. So, when we say extended lipid profile, it takes into account these two things. Whenever there is a decrease or whenever there is an increase in the levels of lipids in our body, the tool that we use is what is called as the extended lipid profile. Now, to know more about dyslipidemias, these are the abnormal levels of lipid and the lipoproteins in our serum, which are due to the disorders that are related to the lipid metabolism. Either the metabolism of lipids is defective here or the metabolism of lipoproteins are defective. Both of these things either an abnormal lipid metabolism or an abnormal lipoprotein metabolism will lead to dyslipidemias. Now, why do we have to do this? Once we know that there is an excess or a decrease in the levels of lipid, it will tell us about the risk factor of having a cardiovascular disease. Whenever you have more levels of lipids in the body, it says that there is more chance of having a cardiovascular disease. Now, there could be different causes for this dyslipidemias. The two most important reasons when a person has got dyslipidemia is the most important is the first one that is the primary where you do not know the cause and the cause is thought to be of genetic origin. Certain people are more prone to have hyperlipidemias because of a primary cause. Another reason is there could be secondary causes that is it is secondary to some other disorders which is already existing. For example, a person with diabetes mellitus or you have a patient who has got a thyroid abnormality probably in them there could be an abnormal lipid profile. Now, both these things that is primary as well as the secondary causes of dyslipidemias. Now, moving on to something what is called as lipid profile. Before we actually see what an extended lipid profile is, we need to know what is a normal lipid profile. Lipid profile is a group of tests that are done to evaluate the levels of these lipids and lipoproteins in the blood. So, you need to have a panel of tests which will tell us what is the levels of lipid and what is the level of lipoprotein in an individual's blood. This group of tests which will tell about these two things is what is called as a lipid profile. There could be many tests which are a part of lipid profile. To list out a few, we have total cholesterol, then you have LDL cholesterol. LDL stands for low density lipoprotein and the cholesterol that is associated to it is called as low density lipoprotein cholesterol. Then there is high density lipoprotein cholesterol. We have triglycerides, there is VLDL and then finally, there is a ratio of cholesterol to HDL ratio. Now, these few things are the ones which are a part of lipid profile. To summarize, lipid profile includes all of these tests. You have total cholesterol, LDL plus HDL cholesterol, there is triacylglycerols, there is very low density lipoprotein and then you have cholesterol to HDL ratio. This is a part of the normal lipid profile. If you have to look at their normal values, lipid profile is preferably better to be in this range. For example, the total cholesterol. It is appropriate to have the total cholesterol levels between 140 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. If it is more than 200 milligram per deciliter, it is an indication that there is a chance of having a cardiovascular disease or the patient could end up having a coronary artery disease. Similar thing holds good when you talk about the TG. TG stands for triacylglycerols or triglycerides. The range is between 60 to 150 milligram per deciliter. 
having a low levels of triacyl glycerol is always good but if it's more than 150 mg per deciliter that's again when you have a chances of having a cardiovascular disease coming to the next one that is the hdl cholesterol the range is between 40 to 65 mg per deciliter having more amounts of hdl cholesterol is always better because as we know hdl cholesterol is supposed to be a good cholesterol so having more levels of hdl cholesterol is always good on the other hand you have low density lipoprotein cholesterol this cholesterol which is associated with the low density lipoprotein is always a bad cholesterol because the function of your low density lipoprotein is to carry the cholesterol from the liver to the peripheral tissue the peripheral tissues could be the major arteries supplying the heart or to the brain when the cholesterol is carried on to this major arteries which supply the heart and the brain it could lead to a myocardial infarction or stroke so it's always better to have a low levels of ldl cholesterol preferably at the lower range around 50 to 60 mg per deciliter is moderate has a chance of having a moderate risk now when we have a lipid profile then why is that we need to do an extended lipid profile we need to have an extended lipid profile because these are the additional tests or parameters that are there and when their levels are elevated they are of more significance for us to assess the risk of having cardiovascular disease now these additional tests could either include lipoprotein a or it could be apoproteins or there could be many more tests apart from these two so basically when we say that we have an extended lipid profile it includes the lipid profile as whatever i have mentioned earlier in addition to it you have other lipids for example you have lipoprotein you have the lipoprotein a you have apoproteins these are the ones which constitute the extended lipid profile to know more details of this we need to know why is that we need to use the extended lipid profile the first and most important thing as lipid profile is done similarly extended lipid profile is also done to determine the extent of dyslipidemia it will give us more accurately as to what type of dyslipidemia it is that's why we do an extended lipid profile apart from this once we know that there is dyslipidemia it will tell us the risk of having a cardiovascular disease so these two things are almost similar to the lipid profile the indications of lipid profile and the extended lipid profile are almost the same in addition to whatever has been said extended lipid profile will help us to monitor the inflammatory status of the individual apart from that we could apply the extended lipid profile in certain diseases like your diabetes mellitus or hypothyroidism or chronic kidney disease or whenever a patient is on drug therapy doing an extended profile is always best now what are the tests that are a part of extended lipid profile there are many of them to list out a few as i said earlier apolipoproteins are the ones which are a part of extended lipid profile there can be many apolipoproteins one among them is apolipoprotein a1 you have apolipoprotein b there is the ratio of apolipoprotein b to a1 we have lipoprotein a there is high sensitive c reactive protein otherwise called as shcrp you have non hdl cholesterol and then there is finally the ratio that is ldl to hdl ratio so these are a few tests which belong to the extended lipid profile panel you have apolipoprotein a1 b the ratio of b to a1 you have lipoprotein a hscrp non hdl cholesterol and then the ratio of ldl to hdl are the part of extended lipid profiles now let's see what are these apoproteins or otherwise called as apolipoproteins there are many types of apolipoproteins out of them there are four major types of apoproteins that is apo a apo b apo c and apo e these major groups are having further subgroups like you have apo a1 apo a2 apo a3 etc now these are the subtypes of these apoproteins basically these apoproteins are proteins and they are synthesized in the liver liver becomes the major site where it is synthesized now if i have to measure the levels of apolipoproteins in the blood there are various uh, ways of measuring it there are two important methods by which we could measure it one is the immunoassay technique and the other one is the immunonephelometry method 
So, these are the ways by which we could measure the apolipoproteins or the apoproteins either it could be A, B, C or E, but for us the most two important uh, apoproteins of importance are apo A and apo B. Now, if you look at the functions of these apoproteins, I have listed a few of the apoproteins and their function. If we see apo A1, this apolipoprotein A1 is a part of the lipoprotein HDL. High density lipoprotein is nothing but a combination of a lipid and a protein. The protein part of HDL is apo A1. Now, this apo A1, the major site of synthesis is liver. Apart from liver, it could be synthesized in the intestine also. What is the function of this apo A1? APO A1 is required to activate an enzyme called as LCAT that is lecithin cholesterol acyl transferase. Therefore, it would favor the cholesterol efflux. So, APO A1 is not only a structural component of HDL, it is also required to activate that enzyme. Moving on to the next APO protein that is APO B100, this is the foremost uh, important APO protein which is a part of LDL and also VLDL. Again, it is synthesized in the liver and its function is that apart from carrying the lipid, it is acting as a ligand for the LDL receptor. It also favors the transfer of cholesterol to the various cells. Moving on to the third one, you have APOC2 which is required as an activator of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase synthesized in the liver and is a part of the lipoprotein HDL as well as VLDL. Moving on to the last apoprotein that is APOE. This again is a part of VLDL and intermediate density lipoprotein synthesized in the liver as well as in the intestine that again acts as a ligand for the LDL receptor, which means that if it is a part of this LDL receptor, it will be able to recognize the LDL molecules. So, these are some of the functions of the apoproteins APOA1, B100, APOC2 and APOE. Let us just look at the first apolipoprotein that is apolipoprotein A1. As I said, this would be the most important uh, part of the extended lipid profile since it acts as a better discriminator for atherosclerotic diseases than just a simple routine lipid profile or you just do a lipoprotein uh, levels in the blood that would not be sufficient. If you have to further explore about what is the chances of having an atherosclerotic disease, it is always better to do a levels of apolipoprotein A1. As already said, APO A1 is a part of HDL. So, more would be the levels of A1 is always better. So, low levels of APO B and high levels of APO A1 or low levels of APO B and the low levels of APO A1 ratio would be a good thing because we know that APO A1 is a part of HDL. More is the amount of HDL, it is more good for us. So, more would be the level of APO A1, more is the levels of HDL. Moving on to the counterpart of it that is apolipoprotein B. This is always seen in these lipoproteins like VLDL, IDL and HDL uh, sorry LDL. Now, when we have this uh, these lipoproteins they are atherogenic especially LDL is an atherogenic lipoprotein which has got one molecule of APOB. So, if more is the APOB it means that it indirectly says that higher is the levels of LDL. Having higher levels of LDL is not preferable. So, indirectly it gives us the number of atherogenic particles that are there in the blood. So, basically this is one single apolipoprotein which will not only help us in predicting the baseline levels of the or lipids, it also helps us to know what is the chance of having a coronary artery disease. So, the order of preference would be the first most important apoprotein would be apoB more is the levels of APOB, more is the chance of having a cardiovascular disease followed by APOA1 and then you have the ratio of APOB to A1. Now, there are a group of disorders in which these uh, lipoproteins could be low. When you have a hyper or a hypolipoproteinemias, they are what are called as dyslipoproteinemias. Again, these are the levels of lipoproteins which are abnormal in the blood. As said, they can be hypo or they can be hyper. So, abnormal distribution of lipoproteins in the blood is what is called as dyslipoproteinemia. It can be a high levels of lipoprotein or it could be a low levels of lipoprotein. There is a classification given by Fredrickson for the hyper uh, lipoproteinemias, which is called as the Fredrickson's classification. There are five types of hyperlipoproteinemias in which you have type 1 where there is the deficiency of lipoprotein lipase. When that lipoprotein lipase is deficient, 
in the blood you have excess levels of chylomicrons. If you look at the levels of cholesterol and tri triacylglycerols in the plasma, their levels are also increased. Apart from this, there is type 2A and type 2B. Type 2A is where you have a mutation in the LDL receptor. So, obviously, there would be an excess of LDL in the blood. There can be an increase in plasma cholesterol, but the levels of triacylglycerol remains normal. Coming to the other subtype of type 2 is type 2B, where again you have the mutation which is of an unknown origin, but the lipoproteins that are elevated here are LDL and VLDL. Again, the plasma cholesterol levels are high and also the triacylglycerols are high because you have an increase in VLDL. Moving on to the third type, you have type 3, wherein the lipoprotein that is elevated is ideal. The reason for this is a genetic variation in the ApoE. There can be an increase in plasma cholesterol as well as plasma triacylglycerols. Moving on to the next one, type 4 is where you have an excess levels of VLDL. The reason for this excess is not known, but the levels of plasma cholesterol and triacylglycerols are elevated. Moving on to the last type, type 5 is where you have excess of VLDL and chylomicrons, which means that there is a marked increase in the levels of triacylglycerols. The reason being the function of VLDL and chylomicrons is to carry triacylglycerol. So, if you have these levels elevated, the lipid which is elevated is the triacylglycerol. So, these are some conditions which are belonging to the category of primary hyperlipidemias. As I said earlier, there are two types, primary and secondary. So, this classification tells us about the primary reasons or the genetic defects which are there and that would indirectly lead to an increase in the levels of cholesterol or the triacylglycerols. So, this is about the hyperlipoproteinemias. On the other hand, we have something what is called as hypolipoproteinemias, which means that these are the disorders wherein you should have a low levels of lipoprotein. To broadly classify them, there are a few here. First important one is the A beta lipoproteinemia, A beta, which means that the lipoprotein which is deficient here is the beta lipoprotein. This happens because you have a defective synthesis of ApoB. Now, ApoB is a structural component of the lipoprotein LDL. So, if you do not have ApoB synthesized, there is no enough formation of LDL. So, there is total absence of LDL, there is no chylomicrons, there is no VLDL, there is no triacylglycerol in the plasma. If you come across a serum sample in which you do not have almost, you have a negligible amounts of LDL, it indirectly tells us that there is a genetic problem here and that is what is called as A beta lipoproteinemia. Another disorder is familial hypo beta lipoproteinemia. Here again, the problem is uh, impaired synthesis of ApoB. It is unlike your A beta lipoproteinemia where there is complete uh, non-production of ApoB. Here, there is some amount of ApoB which is produced. That is why it is called hypo beta lipoproteinemia, where there is a defective synthesis of ApoB. Here again, if you look at the levels of plasma cholesterol and the triacylglycerol, they both will be decreased. Moving on to the next one, you have the Tangier's disease wherein the plasma levels of HDL is almost absent. Since HDL is supposed to be a good cholesterol and in the plasma, if you do not have any amounts of HDL cholesterol, it means that these people are more prone to have a coronary artery disease. So, this is about the hypolipoproteinemias. We looked at the dyslipoproteinemias in which there was hyperlipoproteinemia as well as hypolipoproteinemia. Now, we move on to the next marker, which is a part of your extended lipid profile that is the lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A is structurally similar to the LDL or the low density lipoprotein, but in addition to ApoA, it has got ApoB. So, there would be a link between ApoA and ApoB with the help of the dull sulfide bridges. ApoA, which is a part of lipoprotein A, is homologous to plasminogen. Plasminogen is an enzyme, particularly a protease, which targets the fibrin. So, if there is high levels of lipoprotein A, it will slow down the breakdown of clots. If there is no breaking down of clots, these clots will accumulate in the arteries and that would be a risk factor for coronary artery disease or heart attacks. Now, this is how the structure of lipoprotein A looks like. So, there are two ApoA and ApoB molecules which are linked to each other by disulfide bridges. Moving on to the next marker, you have the high sensitivity 
C reactive protein. Now, whenever there is a high levels of CRP or the HSCRP, this will stimulate the production of the tissue factors. Once that factor is stimulated, it will initiate the production of coagulants, it will initiate the process of coagulation, then there is complement productions, all of these things will bind to the atherosclerotic plaque, thereby increasing the size of the clot that is formed and that leads to cardiovascular disease. So, this is the other important uh, marker of the extended lipid profile. Then we have the non HDL cholesterol which is nothing but the difference between the cholesterol and the HDL cholesterol. This includes LDL, IDL, VLDL and lipoprotein A along with this if we are able to measure the chylomicron remnants all of these things are non HDL cholesterol. So, apart from the HDL cholesterol the other lipoproteins which are there they are a part of non HDL cholesterol along with lipoprotein A. Now, these are the tests which are a part of extended lipid profile. Now, when we are asking a patient to do this kind of an extended lipid profile, should the patient come fasting or non-fasting? So, fasting versus non-fasting is what is most important for us because we need a particular condition in which the patient must come and give us the blood. So, ideally they say that the patient should fast for 12 hours. Now, if I want to estimate the levels of chylomicron, it is always better that uh, the patient must be in fasting for 12 hours because the postprandial plasma there would be an high levels of plasma triglyceride because there would be no much time given for the, the absorption of the triacylglycerol. So, the postprandial sample will have excess levels of triacylglycerol. Now, to clear off this plasma triglyceride you require at least 6 to 9 hours only after this the plasma gets cleared of triacylglycerol. So, ideally if you are collecting the sample for 12 hours it is good, but you are collecting before 12 hours the values that might uh, be abnormal. Now, if I have to ask for the blood for total cholesterol or for the HDL cholesterol, then uh, it can be done in a non fasting state also. Unlike your chylomicron where you had a 12 hours fast a must here, you do not have to be fasting. If you have to go for a blood sample for total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, there is no need of a fasting state here. If it is triacylglycerol and LDL cholesterol, it must be measured during fasting and the fasting duration should be 12 hours. So, as per certain guidelines, it says that fasting for at least 9 hours is a must for lipid and lipoprotein analysis, but it is not always possible to have a 9 hours fast. So, most preferable is 12 hours fasting to measure the lipoprotein when you are doing a clinical or an epidemiological study. Now, what should be the normal levels of these extended lipid profile tests? So, we have various categories there, you have a low risk, average risk, moderate risk and high risk. So, the ones which are given in the table tells us that we should have a cholesterol to HDL ratio between 3.3 to 4.4, then there is a low risk. If it is shooting out above 11, that means that there is a high chance of having a coronary artery disease. Similarly, lower levels of HSCRP is always good you have less than 1 milligram per liter, you have a low risk of having coronary artery disease, but if it is more than 3 milligram per liter, which means that there is a high risk. ApoB, ApoB it is always, uh, it should be less than 80, if it is more than 120, you have a high risk. Lipoprotein A normally there is no normal levels, but if it is shooting above 50 milligram per deciliter, that is again dangerous. The ratio of ApoB to ApoA1 should be between 0.35 to 0.98. But if it is above 0.98, that is again having a high risk of having coronary artery disease. So, to summarize, what we learned today is first we looked at what is lipid profile, the tests which are a part of lipid profile like cholesterol, triacylglycerol, LDL, HDL, VLDL. Now, if you have to extend this lipid profile, you need to add certain other parameters like you have the apoproteins, the high sensitive C reactive protein, then you have the lipoprotein A the ratio of ApoB to A1, these are all the part of extended lipid profile and we looked into whether we prefer a fasting sample or a non-fasting sample. So, whenever you have to estimate the chylomicron level, it is preferred to have a fasting sample unlike your total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol where you could use a non-fasting sample also. With this I thank one and all, thank you so much.